This is a fun project I've been thinking about intermittently since the collapse of the towers on 9-11. The appalling sight of people jumping to their deaths and my subsequent discovery of the terrible design and engineering flaws of the World Trade Center buildings gave rise to the following designs. What I'm going for here is to maximize cheapness, safety, and ease and speed of construction. As a further challenge, I wanted to construct a building of indeterminate height without using normal techniques commonly involved in the assembly of the basic superstructure. This means putting together the skeleton and floor trusses without the use of glue, rivets, bolts, or welds, sort of like Lego blocks. You could take it apart without any difficulty and put it back in the box. To accomplish this, I've chosen the plug, flange, and pin method, the elements of which have been in use since the beginning of wooden and stone building construction. My vertical supports will be steel, cylindrical girders in this configuration. This is the fundamental construction unit. Because the lower supports must be thicker than the upper ones, each floor is somewhat different than the one adjacent to it. So, regrettably, the fundamental construction units cannot, in principle, be all identical. They are held in place with this type of universal pin. You put it in the holes that line up and it automatically locks them together. These connectors can be all identical throughout the height of the building, except where angles are needed as at corners. Here, the hole in the plug for the pin must be turned so as to match up with the hole on the cylindrical girder that mates to it. To secure this design against cumulative slop, I've employed slop cradles at all points of connection. A cylindrical girder is cut on a torch lathe in a sine wave pattern and mated with the end piece that's been welded to the flange. As the two reconnect, no accumulation of slop is possible because, for the pieces to not mate properly, would require that they raise themselves up in the gravitational field. Think about it for a second. It can't move in any direction without going up. And that's just not possible for a heavy structure. The floor trusses are designed to span the entire width of the building so as to provide an open floor area on every second floor. The other floors are discrete offices and the trusses themselves are hidden within the walls of those offices. These are pinned to the flange as shown. The flooring can be conventional with four inches of concrete, but if possible, I'd rather do without. Four inches of concrete is 50 pounds per square foot. For a floor plan of World Trade Center proportions, 200 by 200 feet, that's 2 million pounds per floor of dead weight, or over 900 metric tons. Concrete is needed for only four conceivable purposes. The weight holds the building down in the wind, as in an obelisk. Soundproofing, being massive, it will not transmit much sound to the floor below. As passive fireproofing, concrete is a substantial heat sink. And lastly, the Mafia made you an offer you couldn't refuse. If at all possible, I like to make the floors out of steel cardboard. I can see this as being maybe 60% lighter than the concrete, and it is its own truss. It won't hold the building down as well in a high wind, and soundproofing would have to be active, as an electronic sound nullification, helped out by rubber padding. But in an active fire control system, cool outside air could be pumped through the empty lower chambers where it could take heat from the fire below and blow that heat out of the building without feeding oxygen to the fire. The upper chambers of the cardboard provide ready channels for electrical 
and communications wiring and even plumbing. Such a system may be already in use or been rejected. I don't know since I'm not an architect. But if not, it would require extensive testing before it could be used in a building. Now we need a way to get to the floors of our building. Interior stairwells and elevators should never be used in tall buildings. These must be outriggered and have their own electrical and air circulation systems so that, in the event of a fire, they can still be used by people leaving and fire department personnel entering. The thought of firemen walking up 50 flights of stairs with 100-pound packs makes me tired just to think of it. This is totally unacceptable. If we put a large fan at the bottom of the stairwell, we can push fresh outside air up the stairwell and out the top, thereby creating a slight positive overpressure in the stairwell, which, in conjunction with revolving doors at the entrance to each floor, would keep smoke out of the stairwell. The elevators remain operational because they are not involved in the fire. The electrical and water system for every floor would run up the elevator shaft to feed each floor and could be cut off or left on depending on circumstances. This completes the basic design except for the fun part at the top. On the observation deck there's your standard restaurant, gift shop, tourist trap thing going on. But in addition there is the dead drop. I designed this just after 9-11 inspired by the ghastly sight of people jumping to their deaths in preference to burning alive. The dead drop is a tube you just jump into and fall all the way to the ground, coming out in an underground landing area, sliding to rest without injury. It's fundamentally an amusement park ride on the side of a building. It utilizes the standard laws governing air pressure to get you down the tube at, say, 60 miles per hour, and into the flat slide area, experiencing no more than, say, two Gs at the turn, something no more than what you get in a roller coaster, except you're sliding. As I originally designed the system, there would be multiple exits at every floor. However, that's way too expensive. If they are only on the observation deck, you can charge money to tourists, who want to get the I Survived the Dead Drop t-shirt, only $19.95 plus tax. There is scarcely a teenager who wouldn't take the tube on a dare. The thing would pay for itself, and with people using it for entertainment, they'd surely be not afraid to use it in an emergency by the hundreds. So in the worst case scenario, you go up to the top of the building and jump, take a header or feet first, and live instead of burning to death. In an emergency, a single tube could handle about one person every five seconds. Think D-Day parachutists over Normandy. So around 700 per hour, and if there are four tubes, 2800 per hour. Experiments would have to be done in the computer using a physics program to optimize and iron out the details. But it will, without a doubt, work. <laughs>